Hello everyone, welcome back to Clinical Psychology Community UK. After our little break that we've had over all the doctorate application stuff, but I'm back at it today with a video on diagnosis in clinical psychology, which is probably the most requested video that I've had. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I gave it thorough attention before I came back and did this video. Um, so my name's Holly. I'm currently an NHS assistant psychologist um, and uh, let's get straight into it. So today I am going to be talking a little bit about some historical models of mental health, um, including the biopsychosocial model of mental health. I'm going to talk about some of the strengths and limitations as I see them with diagnosis and I'm going to use a, a model to do that. I'm going to look at the bias and the ethics in diagnosis as well. And I'm also going to kind of talk a little bit about an alternative view um, that we use in clinical psychology a lot. I also put out a call on Instagram. Thank you so much for everyone that gave us a question. Um, so I've got some questions from you. Um, for I've uh, got a specific section um, there. And then also I've kind of got a little section for me to reflect on diagnosis and actually what my opinion, um, how my opinion has affected this video and the content that I've uh, put into it. But I do want to start with a little disclaimer, okay? Um, this video is intended to basically provide my opinion um, on the use of diagnosis and the whole medical model in mental health. It is not exhaustive and really it needs to just bear in mind, view it in the context of the historical and the ongoing debate in clinical psychology about diagnosis. This is just one opinion, it's one voice in that debate. Um, and absolutely, it is a debate. So I welcome lots of other voices and lots of other experiences. This is based on my experiences um, professionally and personally. So there's a little disclaimer there. So don't come to me too much. Um, this is just my opinion. What I want to start with, though, is some historical models of, of, of um, mental illness, as they call it. So generally, if you look up any sort of history of mental health, mental illness is quite often the term used, you kind of have three different um, theories of etiology. So that's kind of um, etiology is kind of the origin, like where it comes from, the kind of story behind that. And actually what we have um, is different belief systems throughout different periods um, of civilization. So firstly, People often thought that actually if there were mental illnesses going on or differences, that they might be caused by supernatural things. So the gods might not be happy um, or that someone might be possessed by evil or demonic spirits or something like that. Um, a displeasure of the gods, you know, there might be a curse on you. It might be because you've sinned. Therefore, you are experiencing these issues. Um, for example, in around sort of 2700 BC in sort of Chinese medicine and um, the concept of positive and negative forces on on us on on humans was was really dominant you know yin and yang um, it, and the idea is that an imbalance between these forces causes mental illness that was the sort of idea back then in that particular culture um, around 1900 BC in, in Egypt in sort of Egyptian culture mental illness was thought to come from a, a wandering uterus which is one of my absolute favorite things that I've learned in psychology um, and it was named hysteria by the Greeks that that idea has per pervaded per persisted um, throughout history about mental health and things like that it's it's been there a long time the idea of a wandering uterus and hysteria um, I mean, the, the term hysteria has persisted through until the 1900s. Even now, we still hear it in, in mental health professional terms. So that's kind of one of the, the ideas. And, and actually, that's generally one of the first ideas that people had about mental illness and where it came from. And, and ha it was a, a theory to explain that kind of behavior. The second one, now this is like a super fancy word, but don't worry, I shall explain it. Um, so somatogenic or somatogenic if you're uber posh. Um, so this essentially um, is where the supernatural ideas were kind of rejected. And it kind of started with the Greeks, the ancient Greeks. Um, so Hippocrates around sort of 400 BC attempted to separate superstition and religion from medicine. Um, and, and basically he systemized the kind of... Um, systematized the belief that mental illness was caused by an imbalance of one or four 
one of four bodily sort of fluids. So you might well have heard of this. So um, it was the four humours. So it was uh, phlegm, blood, yellow bile and black bile. And these, you know, an imbalance between all of those, which was definitely a physiological thing, was thought to result in mental illness and things like that. Um, similarly, Hippocrates, he seemed to like the number four, classified mental illness into four categories, epilepsy, mania, melancholia, and brain fever. I mean, we now know that there are lots of different categories of lots of things, but that was kind of the way that he categorized everything. Um, but something that's really important, yes, they might have thought that mental illness originated in the person rather than in a supernatural way, um, as in a god or, or 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 a spirit doing something to the human the somatogenic idea was that it was within the human there was an imbalance or something going on but there was absolutely no idea of shame or blame recorded in any of the sort of um documents not that i've read them myself but apparently um there, there's been there wasn't any shame or blame associated with mental illness that's kind of something that came a bit later and the third school of thought, I think, theory of etiology, if we like, is psychogenic. So this is kind of what we think about now. Um, I mean, um, Galen Garland in around 170 AD suggested that psychological stress could cause abnormality. Um, although these theories were actually ignored for centuries. The idea that something psychologically in our minds and that, that um, manages the way that we think and we speak and we behave and we feel um, causes mental illness and is caused by mental illness was an idea that was introduced then but not heard for centuries as we'll come to and then sort of between the now we kind of have a little bit of fluctuation it doesn't go in a chronological order like it has done supernatural theories kind of came back between the 11th and 15th centuries because the power of the Catholic Church was under threat um, in, in Western cultures, um, which was, you know, the Catholic Church was massively dominant in lots of different places. Um, but here, supernatural theories of mental health returned. Um, and that was kind of contextualised by large plagues, you know, the bubonic plague and things like that, that were thought to have been sent by God to cleanse humanity. So we kind of have those supernatural ex um, explanations being used again. And that was absolutely applied to mental health as well. Um, you know, if you have a mental illness, well, it's God's, um, it's God's way of um, making you behave, really. That's my opinion. Um, and then again, between the 13th and 18th century, particularly women were massively affected. We were persecuted as witches and we were killed, basically, um, to find out whether we were witches or, or if we died, then we were normal humans, but we still got killed. Um, and women were persecuted, whether they were unwell or not. And quite often, because of the social standing of women at the time, if a woman was um, rebelling, against the norm then they were thought to be hysterical and have an illness and therefore um they were mentally unwell and they were more likely to be persecuted and, and die basically and be murdered um it's all very sad and stressful isn't it really if we look back at a lot of history it's all a bit horrible but those are sort of supernatural theories again but now when we kind of come to the 18th 20th centuries and kind of now actually what we find is that psychogenic and, and somatogenic have come back into the fore far more so in the 18th and 20th centuries, sort of between that time, the dominant models were conflicted, actually, between um, somatogenic, so whether it's being in the body, and psychological, so psychogenic, whether actually there were lots of things within the mind. There was lots of different schools of thought around that. Um, and importantly, why I kind of want to touch on this is, is actually how our understanding of mental illness and the framework that we have around that in terms of services in the UK and where it was built. So that's kind of the reason that I'm going to come on to this a little bit. So in the 16th century, the idea of hospitals and asylums kind of came in. So having a place where we can put all of the mentally unwell people um, in, in one place. Uh, and there was absolutely no idea of treatment or intervention or understanding even of their issues. It was just pop them in there and let them go out of their mind even more because it wasn't understood. Um, they were just different to society. So then in the 18th century, actually, conditions did improve somewhat and people realised that maybe these people are unwell and that they do not need to be kept in one room on their own for the rest of their lives in a padded cell covered in faeces. Like, that's not good for people is kind of the realisation they had. Mind you, after about two centuries of living this way, but anyway, it did happen. Um, and the idea then kind of 
um, sprouted into actually we need to look after these people because that was a novel thing back then. And then if we kind of jump forward a little bit to the 20th century, if you're interested in psychology, you've heard of Freud. <laughs> so Freud and Jung, for example, the, from psychodynamic psychoanalysis kind of um, uh, school of thought was that internally there's conflicts going on within us internally psychologically and that is what causes mental illness or distress that sort of thing um so though with the psychological kind of things somatogenic wise i mean lobotomies persisted so lobotomy is where they would operate on the brain um, and they didn't really know what they were doing and there was no regulation so they would just chop out bits of the brain and see what happened hugely hugely unethical massive issues with it but anyway lobotomies in some form or another persisted in the in the states until the 1970s um and electroconvulsive therapy so um if you've ever seen one flew over the cuckoo's nest um where they have to bite on something and they have an electric current pass through their brain it's not quite as barbaric as that now and it's used in very special circumstances but it's still used in the uk um which still kind of blows my mind a little bit but anyway so that's kind of the idea that we are treating mental health problems and distress with physical health interventions like operating on the brain or, or passing a current through it. I mean, in terms of medications, it's there's a huge industry. Just Google big pharma. And by pharma, I don't mean like Farmville. I mean, pharma, P-H-A-R-M-A, -A, pharmaceutical. Just do a bit of Googling about that. It's uh, it's interesting. And any books by Ben Goldacre, I'd recommend as well. I'll pop, I'll pop them in the description. So medications today, we constantly use medications, to, you know, which is a biological treatment. We're doing something biologically, whether it's addressing hormones or whether it's stressing, you know, um, the, the hormonal systems like the dopamine, those sorts of things, those chemical systems for psychological problems, potentially, is the argument. So sorry about that massively long kind of ramble through historical models of mental health, but actually it's really important to understand how we've arrived at the conclusion that mental illness is basically abnormality. And I think perhaps it's less so now, but particularly in early civilization, in Western cultures particularly, um, where there's more documentation, colonialism. Um, where how mental illness used to be seen as um an abnormality and if you were different then it was just you were painted with the mental illness brush um or the hysteria brush or, or something like that but the idea is that the pervasive idea is that being ab abnormal is firstly it's a problem and secondly it's due to mental Ill, Ill health caused by biological reasons, chemical imbalances, hormones, for example, etc. things like that. So that's kind of how we arrive at the biopsychosocial bio model of mental health, which is uh, pretty dominant at the moment. I think it's probably the main one. I mean, it was the first one I learned at university when I did my psychology undergraduate degree, and it was referred to all throughout my master's, and it's still referred to in the service that I work in at the moment. Um, and I, I absolutely don't want to patronise anybody, but I'll go through exactly what it is. So the biopsychosocial model um, is made up of three different kind of um, ideas of, of mental health and exp the human experience, really. So biologically, it's the idea that genetics might predispose us to some sort of conditions that could be that, you know, if your parent is bipolar, you have a higher chance of being bipolar, something like that. Um, and that biological treatment, so medication or surgery, um, or, or can fix or tackle these factors that cause mental health. So I don't know how many of you might have heard, oh, uh, my doctor told me that I've got a chemical imbalance, so they're giving me my medication to balance my systems. And how much does that remind you of Hippocrates and the four humours, really, they get the whole idea of imbalances? But anyway, so that's kind of the biological side of things. In terms of psychological, Obviously, I'm hugely biased, which I will come on to later. But as a pre-qualified psychologist, pre-training psychologist, I am obviously massively biased to think that this is the most important element. Um, the truth is that all these elements are, are, are really important and um, the uh, salience of each bit will differ between people. So for some people, biologically, it might actually they might have a chemical imbalance and actually medication might be the right thing. But for some people, they might have gone through something really traumatic and actually a psychological intervention might help. 
Um, and I'll come on to social. So psychological, kind of the idea is that psychological stresses can also influence our mental health and our well-being. And that psychological intervention is thought to affect these factors um, and to an extent social factors. So having an intervention where we kind of are able to identify our thoughts and kind of change the way that we respond to things psychologically can have an impact on our distress and actually on our well-being and our mental health. The social side of things is think about social factors. So poverty, political unrest, the environment, the culture, the living conditions that you're in, exposure to difficult or traumatic events and experiences. The idea is that they all contribute to mental health um, and the involvement of services in supporting someone's social situation it can improve mental health. So, for example, if someone is homeless... Um, it's going to be very difficult for them to uh, feel happy because they're homeless. And that's very difficult. That's really, really difficult for lots of reasons in terms of safety and in terms, you know, mental safety and physical safety, having your basic needs met, like being able to wash, being able to use a toilet, all of those things. It's yeah. So for someone who is homeless, their social situation might eclipse all the other things. They might need to get that bit fixed first, if you like, if we're going to use the word fixed. So this would be great if services were set up this way, you know, to to look at each individual person and think about what's important for them and focus on that. And and actually, that's kind of what the, the idea is behind person centred care. Like, that's the idea is that we look at each person and meet their needs individually. We don't have the money to do that is the truth of it. So we don't. And in reality, it can look like this. Um, in lots of different services that I've worked in, for example, substance misuse. Absolutely, there is a biological element to substance misuse and addiction for certain substances, alcohol, opiates, cocaine, to an extent, there is a biological um, addiction there. Um, but the way the service was commissioned was to have a recovery team, which was kind of like the psycho psychosocial kind of side of it. And then we had like a medical team focusing on their physical health needs. Um, so it could be their prescribing, um, their opiate substitute medication. That would absolutely have to be like a doctor, like a medical professional, um, doing the alcohol detoxes or talking to them about any injecting wounds that they had and making sure that they were treated and they had the right advice. Absolutely, that was really important. And I'm not detracting about how important that is. But the psychological side um, for me, for most people, is massively important. You know, yes, you can get someone onto a, onto a prescription that means that by, physically they don't feel they need it. But we know that addiction is in the mind, too, um, and that people can be psychologically dependent on these things. Um, and don't even get me started on the social side. So, if, again, if someone is homeless and they're using heroin, if I were homeless, I don't know what I would do, but I probably would end up using heroin because what else would you do? It's such a difficult place to be. Um, but while that person is still homeless, what are the chances that they're going to reduce their heroin use? Because they, you know, when they don't have a bed to sleep in. Just, just a thought. Um, but this is quite often the issue with the way that services are commissioned. Um, the people who commission the services like there to be outcomes, tick boxes, where you can, um, where you see a problem, you see the symptoms and you see the treatment and then the outcome. And that is a very biological way of looking at things. Um, quite often psychologically it takes more time to kind of understand the problem and there are lots of other issues that you need to tackle and prioritise and work out. So in reality that's kind of how services might be. It, it might be different, it, it depends on the service, um, but in my experience it seems to be far, heavily, far more heavily loaded towards the biological side of things um, and medication is quite often a first point before psychological intervention in lots of services. I'm going to move on, actually, to talk about the thing that we came to talk about, which is diagnosis. Um, from Oxford Languages, this is the definition that's come up. The identification of the nature of an illness or other problem by examination of the symptoms. Now, there's some language I want to pick up here, uh, and that is illness and symptoms. Um, just inherently in the definition of diagnosis, we've already got the idea that illness is, is a truth. Illness exists. Um, and that symptoms exist and actually what we're doing here is questioning whether that's true um, or even helpful um, to say to somebody what are your symptoms it, it, we'll come to it um, and the diagnostic criteria of mental health illnesses 
were actually based on physical health conditions and how they were diagnosed. Um, because in physical health conditions, uh, so for example, like a cancer, someone might well have a lump that's noticeable and observable. Um, so that can be assessed by feeling it and having someone examine it. That's a symptom. Um, they can also, you know, take a history of how tired they are, if they've lost any weight recently. All of those things are observable. And you can say, yes, I have lost weight because I've lost a stone in a week. You know, that's observable. But things like mental health conditions aren't quite that similar. Um, and actually, what we know about having social situations that are different and psychological factors and biological factors is that mental health conditions can affect people in different ways. And, and someone who's gone through the same trauma as someone else might not be affected in the same way. So we're coming to it. I want to talk a little bit about formalised diagnosis. Um, so there are kind of two different categories. Um, there's the DSM, so the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual. Um, that's produced by the American Psychological Association. Sorry. And I've got one here. I got it for Christmas. I'm, I don't know. I just because I just like to have these things to critique. Um, so that is a DSM five. So that is the most recent um, version available, and it's massive. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't have an ICD, um, which is the um, International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems. ICD is the better one. Uh, and the most recent version was the ICD eleven, and that also is another classification system for different diagnoses. Um, the difference is that the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistic, uh, Statistical Manual, um, only lists mental health issues, whereas the um, ICD-11 lists any um, condition or illness diagnosis that can affect humans. So there's lots. Um, but I've kind of done a little timeline for you, and this is going to become very busy, but hopefully this is a little bit helpful. So in terms of formalised diagnosis, and what I mean by that is that there are symptoms of mental health conditions and ways that we can diagnose. Um, the first publication of a list of psychological disorders in the West was by Kreplin, um in 1883, which feels like forever ago. Um, but actually, the first um, DSM was published in 1952. That was the first one that was published. And there were 60 disorders in that book. Um, then we had the DSM-2, which grew to 185 disorders. So already we can see that there's a massive amount there. Um, then we can see in 1974 that actually homosexuality was removed from the reprint of the DSM-2. That's right. Let that sink in. Homosexuality was considered a mental illness that should be treated. I know. I just need to give that all the time that it deserves. Um, and then we had in the 1980, the DSM-3 was published, which grew again to 265 disorders. And then we had a DSM revision, which added another 32 disorders. Then we had the DSM-4, which grew to 365 disorders. And then we had the revision, which um, started to include information about etiology, so kind of the origin of these, the, these disorders. And the latest one we have is the DSM-5. And it's actually very difficult to find out how many disorders are listed in here. And short of counting them all, I checked lots of different sources and it came up with the number 541. If anyone disputes that, I can count it, but it will take me 500 years. Um, so as you can see from the 1950s, we've got nearly 500 extra disorders. It's grown hugely, nearly 10 times what we had at the start in the, in the um, DSM-5. But also the other classification system is the ICD. So the ICD, which was initially called the International List of Causes of Death, and that was very much physical. That was a, a list of diseases, basically, that could kill humans. That was 1893. That was the time when we started to formalise these things. Then we had the ICD-6, which was published by the World Health Organization. Um, there were lots of other versions of it before, but it, this was the first one that was overtaken by the, by the WHO. Um, and, and kind of it looks like modern ones now. Then we had the ICD-7, then the ICD-8A, then we had the ICD-9, and then we had the ICD-10, which was 1990, which for all of my 
life actually um this has been the one that's been used um in teaching and in practice as well but recently there was the icd 11 which reportedly is five times as big as the icd 10 and what's interesting about the icd is that it's very difficult to find how many disorders are listed there particularly mental health disorders are listed there but the idea behind this is just to show you how many disorders there apparently are um, in these classification systems so just something to bear in mind um, that actually, as we keep going, we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Just bear that in mind. But now I want to talk about the impact of diagnosis. And for this, I've kind of used the Bronfenbrenner's um, ecological systems model. So if you haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. Um, it basically suggests that the individual is affected by everything around them. Already that shows my bias um, supporting this model. But the idea is that, you know, you have your individual with individual characteristics and experiences and thoughts feelings, behaviour, you know, all those different um, psychological models that explain how we feel and how we how we are. Um, then we have the microsystem and the mesosystem, which kind of work together and interact. And actually, the microsystem is kind of your immediate surrounding, your immediate environment, your home, your school life, your neighbourhoods, your immediate family um, and so on, your things like that. Then we have the mesosystem, um, which is like, yeah, again, your home, your schools, your neighbourhood, your work, your, and so on, things like that, how all of that stuff interacts. Then we have the exosystem and macrosystem. So that could be mass media, community services, parents' workspace, and then broadly, widely shared cultural values, beliefs, customs and laws, um, things like that. So that's kind of the idea behind the model. Um and what I want to do is kind of use it to, to give you a little bit of a critique of the impact of diagnosis as I see it. This is, again, just my opinion. So in terms of limitations using this model, let's start individually. Well, the label of a diagnosis might be unhelpful to some people or inaccurate. It, you know, if someone were to say to me, well, I, I diagnosed you to be schizophrenic, I might think, well, hang on, that doesn't fit with me. And actually, there's quite a lot of stigma around schizophrenia in terms of what my belief is and, and I now I feel scared so that actually could contribute to self-stigma as well um so that's kind of just individually it might make you feel differently to yourself and relate differently to yourself because actually this diagnosis has kind of changed who you are almost um or, or it's kind of trying to explain your behavior but if it doesn't fit if it's not right then that can be really difficult to manage then we've got the microsystem and the mesosystem. So thinking about diagnosis being required to access some services, it's a barrier. So some people need a mental health diagnosis to access benefits. But actually, if services are not giving diagnoses, then that's very difficult. Or, for example, eating disorder services for a long time. And this is actually in my experience as well. Um, unless you meet the very strict diagnostic criteria, you will not get any eating disorder service support. So uh, at a time when I was trying to access support, my BMI uh, was low, um, but I hadn't lost a more than 10% of my body weight because I was already quite thin. Um, but because I, I didn't meet that criteria, I did not meet the diagnostic criteria. Therefore, I did not have a diagnosis. Therefore, I could not access services. And actually that affected me massively and actually it's probably the reason that I'm interested in psychology but anyway um, and there are also stigma within communities and or cultures um, lots of different cultures and countries and uh, families even have different understandings of mental health and, and can stigmatize them and then we want to think about the wider things so th these are the most important limitations for me but that's just based on my experience um, so I'm in, I'd be interested to hear what you all think. So in terms of the exosystem and the macrosystem, something like diagnosis of mental health disorders based on the, are based on the physiological classification systems, like symptoms. That's what they're based on. That's the belief, um, which is difficult. Um, existing diagnostic criteria are not culturally, culturally or ethnically inclusive. That's the truth of it. So lots of the history that I told you was based on Western ideas, apart from the, the idea from Chinese medicine, which is fine, it might be Eastern, but it certainly does not represent all of the East. Um, and then we think about, well, what about Africa? You know, what about all of these different places? South America, what about North America? What about all of these different places? Fine, North America is more Western, but lots of it was based on the West. Um, that, that is actually the truth of it. 
Um, and because of that, it might be that someone presenting, uh, someone might not meet the diagnostic criteria because um, of cultural or ethnic reasons, but therefore they don't get the diagnosis. So it's a bit tricky. Um, diagnoses pathologize abnormality and normal human responses. So this is my biggest limitation in, in diagnosis, actually. And I, you probably saw it in the previous slide where I was showing how many new disorders there are. I mean, how do we go from having 52 disorders to 541, 62, to 541? How do we go from that? I, it doesn't make sense. The only thing I can think is, oh, there's another weird thing humans do. Let's make that a disorder. Let's write down some random criteria to diagnose it. So um, lots of normal human responses. And the example that I've given there is personality disorders in response to trauma. So what we know about trauma is that it can affect people in, in numerous and significant ways. Um, so lots of people that have, uh, for example, borderline personality disorder, what, that label, have had really traumatic experiences. And actually, is it just, you know, human response to that trauma in the context of our society in which we live, that they have that that behaviour or those experiences or those feelings? And actually, do we need to sort of treat that trauma response um, and help process that trauma rather than give the medication for a personality disorder? Questions? Um, and lastly, power. Power is very important. Um, recovery is late, related to funding, okay? And mental health funding is often cut, especially, I mean, particularly substance misuse or other stigmatised conditions. But things like substance misuse are so often the word junkies or druggies or whatever is used to stigmatise that, that group. And actually, they're not contributing to society. So why should we fund them to get better? Well, the answer is lots of them have been through horrendous things that we cannot even imagine. And yeah, they might drink a bit to help them cope with that. And maybe that's a normal way of, of doing that. If you're homeless, are you going to want to be so numb that you're not aware of what's going on around you? Probably. So, um, yes, power. And what I mean here is, you know, the, the, the powerful groups are the ones that, you know, the government people that went uh, that were privately educated Boris Johnson for example all of these people that are making decisions about the public money that is spent often have absolutely no idea what it's like to be a service user um, and to try and access that and actually they don't care because service users are far more vulnerable and not sometimes not able to use their voice as much so there's that inherent power imbalance that if you have a diagnosis um you're vulnerable or you're dangerous like schizophrenia quite often that that triggers uh, uh, an association that's about danger anyway there's my little rant i am going to try and talk a little tiny bit about strengths um oh the other thing to say though uh, is in my experiences services are often commissioned to, to run multidisciplinary teams so you'll have like a doctor, you'll have psychologists, dietitians, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, whoever. You have lots of nurses, lots of different people. And actually, there tends to be quite a lot of difference um, in the service and also in, in the disciplines. So nurses and doctors will ob obviously, you know, jump to the biological ideas um, and, and want to diagnose and fix and treat the problem, treat the symptoms of the problem. Um, whereas psychology tends to work on presentation and use formulation, which we'll come to. So there is some di differences there, and that definitely depends on the service and, and the area. Lots of things like that. So in terms of the strengths, individually, I think for, for lots of people, diagnosis actually gives that person an explanation for their experiences and their feelings. Um, Oh, finally, I understand now that actually what I'm going through is just a response to trauma. And 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 actually, now I understand why I feel the way that I do. And actually, it can be quite destigmatizing because someone might just think that they're a terrible person because they have suicidal thoughts or homicidal thoughts even. But actually, it could be something that's going on for them, a mental health problem. So sometimes it can be really destigmatizing for people. Um, and I think in my experience of weight management where lots of the stigma around uh, around carrying more weight is that um they're lazy and that people should just be able to stop eating and just be healthy and it's so easy and why aren't you doing it it's just laziness um but actually if someone learns that they're eating 
um, in a disordered kind of way. Um, and that's as a result as a result of something some trauma or an adverse experience then that really helps them understand oh it's the reason i'm finding this so difficult is because i have a mental health issue so that can be really helpful for people in terms of the microsystem and the mesosystem yeah diagnosis allows access to services and or benefits sometimes so actually it can open doors for people like i said about eating disorders if you meet that criteria you'll get some support so it can be helpful for people and it can can help families understand someone's difficulties a little bit more, can do. Um, so, you know, if someone's child is diagnosed with ADHD, it might make sense. Actually, it's not just them being naughty. They really struggle to sit still and focus for a long period of time. Um, so it can kind of help people understand. And it also helps the individual, it could, could help the individual um, engage better at work because they might have a diagnosis that they can share with their employer and say, actually, I need reasonable adjustments or, or something like that. So actually, they might be able to have a better, better chance at recovery if, if there's more support available based on this diagnosis. Because what diagnosis does is it gives us all a shared understanding of what's going on, as long as that understanding is right. Not like um, if you said someone was schizophrenic, you'd be scared of them. That's not a right understanding of the condition. And the exosystem and macro system, well, it helps people relate to each other. Things like support groups and, and again, things like campaigns and charities provide information, advice and support based on diagnosis. Beat the eating disorder charity. I know I've been very focused on eating disorders. Apologies. There are lots of different um, places or um, gender dysphoria um, uh, support groups, things like that. And I use that because that's the diagnostic term. That's why I'm doing that. Not that I don't believe that it's a real thing. So hopefully that's kind of given you an idea of what my opinion is of limitations and strengths. But I want to just talk a little bit about bias. So there are lots of different biases. So there's cultural, racial, ethnic, gender, age. And then the big one, colonisation and clinical psychology and psychiatry. As I've alluded to, um, a lot of the diagnostic criteria and classification systems were based on Western history and Western presentations of mental health and Western thinking around uh, philosophy around mental health, um, uh, which has been imposed on people from all different cultures. That's what the colonization bit means, is that we're sort of whitewashing, essentially, um, mental health experiences. And actually, this happens everywhere. Like this happens throughout services. So there's a, a doctor, I think he was a junior doctor when this happened, but I hope and I, I really hope I'm saying this right. Apologies if I'm not. Um, Malone McQuende was uh, a junior doctor at the time, I think, when he wrote a, a guide called Mind the Gap. And this was um, written about how to diagnose conditions and diseases on black and brown skin because that had never been done before. And I am talking like the last few years this happened because all of the diagnostic criteria and physical health conditions were based on white people. And we've had those, that, those systems forever. But nobody thought to write uh, how a, a disease might present on black skin and brown skin because it's different. I, I, it blew my mind when I heard that anyway. So that's kind of, that absolutely extends to psychology as well. Lots of our research is based on that and, and we're getting better at it, definitely. But it, it, there's there's more. Um, but basically, all diagnosis is based on Western values, um, Western ideas of what is normal. For example, how we've conceptualized gender dysphoria is wanting to be another gender is abnormal or gender fluid is still seen as or, or gender neutral or non-binary is seen as abnormal. And we pathologize that by making it a mental health condition. Well, is it? Is it a mental health condition, or is it actually that something, something was problematic in the in the gestation period, which meant that the wrong gen, the wrong sex, um, developed? You know, who knows? But anyway, we've made it into a mental health thing. And absolutely, feeling like you're not in the right body can absolutely affect your mental health. But I think it's more a, a, a consequence than a, than a cause as such. So then I want to talk a little bit about ethics. Firstly, who are we to pathologise someone's experience? And what I mean by pathologise is say that that is disordered. Who are we to tell someone that their behaviour, their experience, their feelings is disordered? I don't take kindly to that. If someone told me I was disordered, that means I'm you're othering somebody. Um, 
And actually, who are we? Yeah, we're fine. We might be based on evidence and it might be based on lots of training and things like that. But we need to remember who are we to do that to somebody and, and how is that helpful? We need to make sure that actually the most important thing we're doing is helping people in, in terms of helping them maybe change the way that they feel, change their behavior, um, change the way they relate to themselves or others, help them reach their goals, not just tell them that they're disordered. Um, remember that remembering as well that a diagnosis can actually change the course of someone's life. Being diagnosed with some, something can be can become a central part of someone's identity. And us professionals need to remember that. Um, and the, the, it really can change the course of someone's life. Then we have the NDT approach. Um, as I've kind of said, there are lots of different benefits to an MDT and there are lots of different issues with an MDT. Um, and I think it depends on the service that you're working in. Uh, uh, for example, like substance misuse, again, was very biological. That was very much the focus and more, far more funding went into that side of things. Um, but in weight management, um, it seemed to be fairly equal, actually. And anyone that needed psychology support could have it. But we need to make sure that when we are using an MDT approach, that we are doing it ethically and that we are doing it in a person centered way that may mean something for them. Not just so we can say, well, we are professionals and we all agree that you are disordered. Again, coming back to that. And the last one is making sure that we're culturally inclusive in our practice. That is essential. We have to be able to do that. And, and the way I see it is that it's on me as a white professional to understand what it's like to be someone from an underrepresented ethnic um, or racial or cultural group. It's really important for me to be able to educate myself on that. But making sure that we're culturally inclusive in, in all stages of assessment, formulation, intervention and evaluation. And in diagnosis, thinking about what is normal in their culture, because diagnosis, as we've said, is all about abnormality. So if something is normal in someone else's culture, who are we as a white person to say, well, I think that's disordered because in my culture, we think that's wrong. No, we must not. We must not. It's awful. We can't do these things. So that's just a little bit on ethics. Um, now, an alternative view, I mean, it's not an alternative really because it kind of goes alongside, but formulation. We, I've done a video on formulation. I'll link it down below if you want to see it. It gives you lots of different ideas of what formulation is. But it doesn't need to be based on diagnosis. A formulation is is a collection of what's going on for that person. It's a mapping out of what's going on for that person. And different psychological models have different approaches to it. But generally, lots of these different things pop up. So their presenting issue, why they've come to you, what what is their distress? Are they distressed about their presenting issue or are they distressed about something else? Do they have the ability to change? Do they have any readiness for change? Are they motivated to make any changes? What's their frailty looking like? What's their medication looking like? What about physical health issues? How does that imp impact on their mental health? Because our physical health, you know, our physical health definitely has an impact on our mental health, particularly for someone who might be older, like frailty. It's very difficult for people to, to adjust to. Then we can think about attachment, for example, or other theories to explain kind of why someone might be feeling the way that they are. What's their history? Have they had any treatment before? Any intervention? Are they on medication? What's their social situation like? Mapping all of these different components can really help you understand a problem. And a diagnosis is not needed for this. What you're doing is really collecting it all and prioritizing it to make sure that you work on things that they want to work on. And you're doing this collaboratively. Um, and in my experience, that is kind of what more psychologists tend to do. Really, that's kind of how we're trained rather than assessment. What is the diagnosis? Then we'll, or, you know, then we'll intervene. It's not that it's OK. Let's get a good idea of what the problem is. So now I want to move on to some questions from you. And I quite often do this on the Instagram. So follow us on Clinical Psychology Community UK. We have just hit 2000 um, followers on that, which is amazing. And we've just done a giveaway. So congratulations to the winner of that who won a bit of mentoring. Um, uh, so keep an eye out uh, and follow us there so you can get involved in um, giving us some ideas for questions and also in the future giveaways. So some of the questions I had from you, what are the current issues in the NHS around diagnosis? So I kind of touched on this throughout, but I, I will give you kind of a, a rundown. So like I said, with MDT working, I think there are there are some issues there um, around the difference of opinions and different services um, having different ideas of diagnosis. So in my experience um, in Wales, I work in a primary care service like IAPT, 
we tend not to require a diagnosis, but secondary care services assess for a diagnosis. It, it tends to be in my experience of it. It's not always, but it does tend to be my experience of it. So different services at different levels will require different kind of diagnostic things um, and will have different ways of diagnosing and working with people. And actually, there are differences in the regions as well. So whether you're Wales, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, um, or, or even within those countries, different health boards, health NHS trusts, services, all very different. Um, the other thing is whether we're using the ICD or the DSM. Tends to be the ICD in my experience, but lots of DSM references in a lot of places and in the NICE guidance. Lots of different references there. So uh, there seems to be no kind of consensus on which one we're following. So there's there's some things. Um, is it difficult to diagnose people? And if so, is there a set or thorough procedure? So I have not really worked in many diagnostic services. And maybe that's just because I prefer to work in trans diagnostic services. Um, and also, I don't diagnose. You know, I'm not a psychologist. So this is difficult to say. Um, again, you're going to get so bored with me saying this, but it depends on the person, depends on the presentation, depends on the service, depends on a lot of things. Um, so classification systems are different, but they share similarities. So both the DSM and the ICD have clear criteria and timeframes to help you diagnose things. Um, for example, some diagnoses can be controversial in some circles. Personality disorders are currently being questioned as a diagnosis. Seasonal affective disorder, for example. Um, but some might be more straightforward in terms of diagnosing um, something like depression or social anxiety. Um, OCD, those sorts of things might be a little bit easier to diagnose. Um, and services have set systems, actually. Um, so it might be that um, uh, nurse practitioners, mental health practitioners assess someone, like how it is in our service but they wouldn't diagnose, they would refer on to someone else to diagnose. So yes, there are procedures, um, but we come back to the same question, is a diagnosis helpful? And if not, then why are we trying to diagnose somebody if it's not helpful? What's the point? Just so we can tick a box and say they're OCD, we've had 15 OCD clients in the last week. No, it's not, it's not good enough. Um, how are patients referred to clinical psychologists? So uh, it really depends really depends on why people need to see a psychologist whether they are being referred for an assessment like a neurological assessment uh, and maybe some sort of intervention around that or whether they're being referred for a therapy but generally clinical psychologists are only accessible by professional referral um or private um, those are those are some ways that you can do it but it really really depends um on lots of issues and I think this is the last question, yeah. So how is it different from a diagnosis given by a psychiatrist and how is it similar? So this, again, hugely varies. Um, it depends on the service. So like I said, in weight management, the psychologist would diagnose eating disorders um, if required and if it was helpful. Um, but whether that was actually a, a formal diagnosis or whether that was just a working kind of formulation and it was helpful for that person to have that kind of label to understand what was going on for them, um so you so that that was one of the things that happened but in some services um only psychiatrists will, will diagnose someone um as and typically that as the named professional as the most senior professional um so it might be that the mdt will do an assessment where all professionals all disciplines will get involved in the assessment and make their recommendations for what they think their diagnosis is and what's going on but the psychiatrist will be the one to write the diagnosis and say this is what is happening and record it on the file that sort of thing um in terms of similarities both psychiatrists and psychologists will use assessment techniques like history taking, um, outcome measures, screening measures, motivational interviewing, use the diagnostic criteria to, to kind of see whether there's a diagnosis. And in terms of differences, well, psychologists are highly skilled in using formulation um, and they tend to focus on that rather than um, a diagnosis. They'll tend to focus on what the presenting issue is, what the distress is that's associated with that and what the goal is. Um, rather than ticking boxes to say, yes, they meet that criteria, they meet that criteria, because that's not particularly helpful always. We'll see. So please, if you've got any other questions, pop them down below. But I just kind of want to finish with some of my reflections on this. Um, I've been wanting to do a video on this for quite a long time, but I've always been a bit nervous because I'm very 
uh, I am quite opinionated on on the medical model of things in certain situations. I think it has its place, um, and there are definitely situations where there are biological causes for things and factors that that um, impact on people. But I do think there are massive issue, uh, issues. But firstly, my awareness of my bias against the medicalization of mental health and the over pathologizing of normal behavior. I am, whenever I see the word diagnosis, I just think, I don't believe it. Like, why are they pathologizing their normal behavior? That's always my go to. So I am very aware that when I've been writing this, that that is a bias that I hold. And language is important to me. And like I said, I will pick up on words and kind of some words really get the hackles up on my back. Um, so things like well-being and health and presentation, issues, intervention are far more preferred to me than things like illness, treatment, symptoms. And one of the things I noticed, actually, when I first started working in mental health is that I would use words like patients and illness and treatment and symptoms because that's all I knew. That's that's all I knew as a client, as a service user, um, as a student and as as a, an early professional. That's all I knew. So it took took me some time to kind of train myself out of that because it wasn't consistent with my values and my beliefs. And then I have lots of discomfort with the medical model that comes from historical exploitation. You know, lots of the research studies that, that were done to back up diagnosis were not ethical, maltreatment, um, the abuse of people with mental illness, for example, in asylums, things like that. The idea that these beliefs persist today is quite unnerving and concerning. Um, the idea that we other people with mental illness um, and the stigma that's I still find that very difficult and that some labels some diagnoses have far more stigma uh, that's based on actually a really terrible understanding of what the issue is schizophrenia is one people just assume they're going to be dangerous and it's not that at all or people um, assume that if someone is using heroin that they're a terrible person they're quite often some of the most traumatised people you'll ever meet. That's the truth of it. So anyway, that's just, that is concerning. And there's something for me about judging a society by how we look after our most vulnerable. Um, and actually, I don't think we are looking after our most vulnerable in the best possible way for lots of reasons. So I think when we diagnose and we pathologise their behaviour and their experiences, and put them into this vulnerable, you're a client category, let's take your power away because you're a client. I I just, I, I don't think that's a helpful way of doing things. Those are just my reflections. Um, they're my main ones. I've got lots of different thoughts around this, but these are just the main ones that came to me when I was writing this. Thank you so much for watching. I just wanna ask you, what do you want from me in the nicest possible way? Um, I would, I really want this. The reason I called it Clinical Psychology Community UK is to build that community. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you want me to do. Comment below. Message me on Instagram or Facebook. I'll always reply. Give me a message. Um, give me ideas for videos. Any Q&As you want me to do that are focused on something. Any webinars. Any recorded videos that you want me to do. Just let me know if there's anything you're interested in. Um, or if, even if you want to come and be a guest and we can have a chat on one of these or maybe on a live webinar. And also, is there anyone interested in a reflective space for people that have kind of not been successful this year on doctorate applications and interviews? Um, I often quite, my imposter syndrome comes out quite a lot when I do these things, but actually this is something I am hugely experienced in after my sixth rejection in a row. So if anyone does want to have kind of a reflective space where we can talk about some of these things and in, in, with people that understand, please comment below, message me, whatever. Just um, come and have a chat and we, we can see if that we can get a group of people together that kind of want to have a chat about it. And lastly, thank you so much for watching. Um, I really hope you enjoyed that kind of whistle stop tour of a bit of history and a bit of understanding about diagnosis. Um, let me know your thoughts and I will see you next time. Bye.